We've now reached one of my favorite parts of the weekend when we recognize the most recent Alumni Achievement Award recipients. This year's recipients exemplify how Brandeis alumni are using their education and talents to help repair the world and to literally save the planet. I know they make us all feel especially proud to be Brandesians. President Leibowitz will now present the awards to this year's recipients who will join us on screen. Thank you, Lewis. This is a, a great part um, of today's program, and it's one of my favorite times of the year. This year, there are three Alumni Achievement Award recipients. Patricia Hill Collins, class of 69 and PhD class of 84. Susan Reich Weiss, class of 71. And Drew Weissman, class of 81, also MA 81, and a parent of a student from the class of 2015. All three recipients of this year's Alumni Award are at the forefront of critical issues facing the United States and the world, the coronavirus pandemic and racial injustice. The Brandeis Alumni Achievement Award represents the highest form of university recognition bestowed exclusively upon alumni. It's given in recognition of distinguished contribution to one's profession or chosen field of endeavor. And I'm honored to recognize our three awardees today. First, Patricia Hill Collins. Patricia Hill Collins has dedicated her career to understanding the intersections of race, gender, and class. Distinguished University Professor Emerita at the University of Maryland College Park and Distinguished Professor of Sociology and Africana Studies Emerita at the University of Cincinnati, Collins is the author of 10 books. In 2008, she became the first African-American woman to preside over the American Sociological Association. A Philadelphia native, Patricia came to Brandeis University in 1965, where she was deeply influenced by Pauli Murray, a civil rights leader and the university's first professor of African-American and women's studies. Patricia received her master's degree from Harvard University and directed the African-American Center at Tufts University before returning to Brandeis to earn a doctorate in sociology. Her books include Black Feminist Thought, first published in 1990 and honored with numerous awards, and Black Sexual Politics. Her other works include the widely used textbook, Race, Class, and Gender, an anthology, Black Sexual Politics, African Americans, Gender and the New Racism, and Fighting Words, and Fighting Words, Black Women and the Search for Justice. She has also authored more than 50 articles and essays and dozens of film and book reviews. In 2013, she received Brandeis's Joseph B. and Toby Gitler Prize for scholarly excellence and contribution to racial, ethnic, and religious relations. So with admiration and gratitude, I present Patricia Hill Collins with the Alumni Achievement Award, whose citation reads, Patricia Hill Collins, an eminent scholar and leader in social theory at the intersection of feminism, gender, race, and social inequality. The author of 10 books, among them, the award-winning Black Feminist Thought and Black Sexual Politics, and the first African-American woman to preside over the American Sociological Association. Congratulations. It is now my honor to recognize Susan Reich Weiss. The concept of a coronavirus might have become known to most people only last year, but Susan Reich Weiss, class of 71, Professor and Vice Chair of Microbiology at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, has been studying coronaviruses for four decades. Weiss is co-director of the Penn Center for Research on Coronavirus and Other Emerging Pathogens, established this past March to coordinate and boost the university's efforts to confront the COVID-19 pandemic. Susan was raised in Yonkers, New York, as a biology major at Brandeis University and later as a graduate student in microbiology and molecular genetics at Harvard, Weiss worked in bacteriology labs before switching to studying viruses. After Harvard, Weiss joined a retrovirus lab at the University of California, San Francisco. She moved to Penn in 1980, where she developed a lab that focuses on researching the basic science around coronaviruses and has continued this line of research for four decades. She also gained a reputation for mentoring young scientists serving from 2010 to, 19, 2010 to 2019 as associate dean for postdoctoral research training. In the early 2000s, attention to coronavirus began to show or grow with the outbreak of the SARS coronas, coronavirus and continued with the 2012 MERS coronavirus outbreak. Each of those coronaviruses caused fewer than 1,000 deaths worldwide. 
Susan is credited with helping to speed up the understanding, treatment, and ultimately, ultimately the vaccines of SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. So with admiration and gratitude, I recognize Susan with the 2021 Alumni Achievement Award, whose citation reads, Susan Reich Weiss, a pioneer in the study of coronaviruses whose scientific research over the past four decades has helped with the understanding of the 2002 SARS and the 2012 MERS outbreak, as well as the SARS-CoV-2, the virus that caused, causes COVID-19. Founding co-director of the Penn Center for Research on Coronavirus and other emerging pathogens. Congratulations. Thank you. And last, it is my honor to recognize Drew Weissman. Drew Weissman, class of 81, MA 81, and a parent, class of 2015, is a professor of medicine at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania and director of vaccine research at the School's Division of Infectious Diseases. More than 20 years ago, Drew began studying how messenger RNA inside cells could be used to create vaccines. His collaborative work is now credited with laying the groundwork for the COVID-19 vaccines created by Moderna and Pfizer BioNTech. Drew, who grew up in Lexington, Massachusetts, was a biochemistry major at Brandeis and received his PhD from Boston University. When he arrived at Penn in 1997, he began collaborating with biochemist Catalin Carrico on using mRNA as a basis for a vaccine. Over the years, many researchers gave up on mRNA, but Drew and Catalin persisted. By engineering a modified version of the messenger RNA and then developing a system to deliver it to its target, the two researchers laid the groundwork for the vaccines brought to fruition by Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna. Together, they were awarded this year's Lewis S. Rosensteel Award in Basic Medical Research from Brandeis and the Rosensteel Foundation. Weissman is now focusing on an even more ambitious, ambitious project, developing a vaccine for all coronaviruses. Besides mm -hmm. SARS-CoV-2, two other lethal varieties of coronaviruses, SARS and MERS, have spread among humans in recent years. Drew's breakthroughs are another example of how basic science innovation can advance the sciences in particular, address pressing health challenges. And so with admiration and gratitude, I present Drew Breisman with the 2021 Alumni Achievement Award, whose citation reads, Drew Weissman, a groundbreaking biochemist whose basic science research over the past two decades has had profound and worldwide implications, a collaborator in the modification of nucleic acids for RNA therapeutics and vaccines, created with laying the groundwork for the Moderna and Pfizer BioNTech COVID vaccines. Congratulations. And now we move to a wonderful part of the program where we have a conversation with our three recipients and I have a host of questions to ask them. And, and I think what I would prefer to make this easier uh, on all of us um, is if we answer these questions in the following order. I'll ask this question and I hope that each one of you can provide uh, an answer in the order of the way I see people on the screen, Patricia, then Drew, then Susan. So I have a few of these questions and then we'll take questions of course uh, from our alumni and Lewis will come on to, um, to um, direct that traffic. Okay, first, as uh, president of the university, I can't begin a conversation with such esteemed alumni without asking about your time at Brandeis. So why don't we begin, and Patricia, as I said before, you can go first. Could each of you tell me what drew you to Brandeis, first of all, and how you chose your major? So what brought you to Brandeis, and then how did you choose to study what you ultimately studied here? I think it's important for you to know that I'm the first person in my family to graduate from college. So I had not the same situation as many people have. What drew me to Brandeis was that Brandeis reached out to me. This was the beginning of affirmative action or positive action, where because I scored really well on the, on the PSAT, there was a little box I could check uh, for schools that wanted to get in touch with students like myself. And I checked that box. I claimed it. And Brandeis sent me material. And I looked at the material and I trusted the brochure. And anyone who's ever taught in a university knows the brochure doesn't necessarily match what you're going to experience. 
When I arrived on campus, as far as I was concerned, it was like I never had a chance to do a campus visit. So the first time I visited Brandeis was my first day of campus, and it was a shock. But what a rich environment. I was fortunate enough to go to school during a period of time when there was a lot going on. I was interested in race and I was drawn to sociology because it was the only area that was trying to think through in a very substantive and important way how we deal with race. So that's how I ended up in sociology and there's more to the story, but I'll stop there. That's terrific. Thank you, Patricia. Drew, how about you? So I, I was always interested in science uh, and I was attracted to Brandeis' science program. Um, and I, I continued my interest throughout Brandeis. I, my choices were to graduate in three years or to stay a fourth and get a master's degree. I chose to do research because it interested me. Um, so you know, the, the, the attraction was it was a great campus. It was a tight campus. The people got along great. People supported each other and they had a great science program. Thank you, thank you, Drew. How about you, Susan? Okay, so my choice was um, a little bit more random. Um, I just had a, a, an older friend who went to Brandeis and uh, it just appealed to me. My other choice was to go to one of the big state universities in New York, which costs half as much money. So with some arguments with my parents, um, I convinced them to let me go to Brandeis and I, with the provision that I would work every summer and pay as much of it as I could myself. Um, and I think it was well worth it. Um, I also like Drew wanted to do science and I saw Brandeis as a place where I could really have great rigorous science, but also I was interested in other things. I took several years of Russian and Spanish. I really like languages. So that for me, that was really um, a plus of Brandeis, being able to do science and being able to be have a broader education and having friends that were interested in all different kinds of um, disciplines at the time. So I have absolutely no regrets. I was really glad I went to Brandeis. And oh, and I should mention too, I had the opportunity, as Ron mentioned, to, um, to work in several labs, to really be part of a research lab, which got me really hooked on, on uh, going further in science. We're glad all you came to Brandeis too. One more follow-up question about Brandeis though. How would you say your time at Brandeis? Patricia, you mentioned it was a very rich time to be on this campus. And, and Drew and Susan mentioned that science had already had an outstanding reputation, but how would you say your time at Brandeis influenced your future career path, what you chose to do uh, for your career? How did your time, these four years, uh, or in, yeah, four years, uh, how, how did it influence you? For me, the liberal arts aspect of it was really important. What I learned at Brandeis was how to think for myself and how to research for myself and how to ask questions that other people hadn't necessarily asked. And I found the freedom on campus to do that. That was very different than my high school. Sociology, music, I was interested in music. I was interested in math. There was a lot that I could explore on campus. And that has influenced the kind of work that I've been able to do since, very much so in terms of my theoretical and conceptual work. Thank you. Drew. So, you know, it, it's kind of a difficult question because th there's so much I can say. I, I think what really sticks out in my mind is the collegiality, the collaborative nature, and the friendships that I developed at Brandeis. Um, it, it was an incredibly warm and supportive community. And, you know, I, I was in, I was a pre-med, I, I, I got an MD, PhD afterwards. It's an incredibly stressful time being in the pre-med program, but I had the support of not only the students, that, that my friends, but the teachers as well. They wanted us to succeed. And I think that's what shaped my future, where I now have a lot of students in my lab and I work with them to help them succeed. And, and that's what Brandeis taught me. I, I guess I, I, I agree with just about everything that the two previous people said, and particularly what Drew said about um, this sort of, I, even though I wasn't pre-med, I was, I had all my classes with the pre-med group. And this was a pretty tight group of people that, um, that worked together and studied together and that sort of thing. But for me, the, I think the most influential thing was the lab, I worked in uh, the lab of David Gillespie, who left uh, Brandeis a very long time ago and actually moved to Philadelphia. Um, 
but, but anyway, working in his lab, I got to work along with the graduate students and really uh, do my own research project, which really got me excited about going to grad school in microbiology. And from there, I, I went on to switch, as you said, to virology. So that's, so Brandeis had a big influence on me that way. I suspect the, uh, the follow-up question that I would have here, you know, uh, very different responses from Patricia versus Drew and Susan, but what about the uh, political climate on campus at the time? Patricia and Susan both there in the 60s and carried over to the early 70s and Drew there in the 70s going into the early 80s. The science area might be different from the social science area in terms of experience, but I'm wondering how the environment on campus, the, the activism that Brandeis was known for at that period of time, how that affected all of you or any of you. Patricia, do you want to go first? Well, it had a profound effect on me. Um, Martin Luther King was assassinated in 1968, which was halfway through my degree. So I experienced arriving on one campus and leaving a very different campus in terms of how racial issues uh, were operating. And also uh, the war was an ongoing issue on campus in terms of those times. I want to stress though, that it's really important to realize that you can be passionate about something, politically involved and be an excellent student. It's not a question of choosing one or the other. It's actually using uh, your education to be excellent, to do bigger things. And that to me was what I took away from those years. I appreciated the activism. I appreciated all the things that were going on around me. But I was the bookish student in the library all the time. That's where I spent my time. And it was well worth it. So, you know, I, I, I was involved in the activism. And, and back during that time, it was mixed. There were a lot of issues that people were concerned about. Everything from environment to racial equality to voting to Jews for Jesus. Um, it, it was a big range of things. And, and be, because a lot of my friends were political science majors and you know, we supported each other, I was interested in those things. But my, my main focus, I, I was in the lab doing research and that's where I was happiest. The, this past year has, you know, I, I've been on the news and, and in film and, and TV and, I'm, I, I found that I'm not happy doing that. I'm happy working in the lab. So th th that's my happy place. Yes. yes. <laughs> Susan. Yeah, I think I have to uh, quite agree with you. I was in, in, uh, overlapped with Patricia at Brandeis and I really agree, also saw a lot of things going around, uh, going on around me. I saw the anti-war movement. In the and I think it was in '69 there was a, a student strike and uh, well not really a strike but all the classes shut down except for organic chemistry which I was taking at the time because those guys would would never shut down so again there was this sort of mixture of all this turmoil going on a, around us and um, all these really terrible things I think there was there were students hiding a, a draft dodger in one of the buildings um, there was um, recruitment for for military recruitments being protested it was it was really a pretty um, I don't know, it was a terrible time in a way, but but um, I also uh, kept studying my chemistry like um, like everyone else because we had to. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, I think all three of us, it sounds like all three of us continued to do our, our studies while, while the world was burning around us too. It's I'd like to add something though. Um, it's not that I was squirreled away in the library and uninvolved. What I'd like to stress is that involvement the, the classroom and outside the classroom work together. I happen to be in the class law as an instrument of social change that was taught by Pauli Murray while the building where we were holding our class was taken over. It was very difficult to squirrel oneself away in many situations of, from what was going on outside. And I don't feel it was terrible. I felt it was really quite important that those types of activities occurred. The issue was navigating it and making sense of it. Yeah, I, I didn't mean it was terrible that those things happened, but it was it was just a lot of a lot of turmoil. And and I guess for we science people, it was a little bit easier to squirrel ourselves away in the science quadrangle because yeah. it, it was kind of separate. <laughs> but no, I, I totally support a lot of what was going on. 
it's interesting as a non-Brandesian coming into Brandeis and as an administrator, um, the one thing I hear most in, in traveling and engaging um, alumni is this issue about the incredible engagement of the student body. Uh, it's the one thing that comes to mind when they rethink their experience at Brandeis. As Drew said, there are a number of issues that they bring up. I never heard Jews for Jesus, but I heard a lot of the other ones, the environmentalism, and I heard about apartheid, and I heard about race relations, and I heard about all these issues. Uh, but this is what Brandesians seem to recall most about their, in addition to loving their educational experience, by the way. They don't talk about yeah. student life. They don't talk about the parties. They don't talk about those issues. They talk about these two things, academic excellence, and the activism. And I think many of us administrators have gotten a little soft that the first sign of student activism, we get all nervous and we get all, you know, exercised about where is this heading? But in reality, it's been part of Brandeis's history. And I think, you know, some of us could really learn, step back and learn by talking to the alums to hear what it was like, because all of us survived and all of you survived uh, to the benefit. Okay, let's move on. Now, uh, all of you have had uh, re relatively long and storied uh, research uh, careers. And I'm wondering um, what kept you going? In other words, uh, there are times, and I know in some cases, especially with science, when you fail at something, it could be easy to throw the towel in. But even in the social sciences, when you think about pushing a new idea, a new paradigm in thinking, Patricia and Drew and, and so, Susan in science is probably similar. Uh, what kept you going? What motivated you to keep up what you were doing to become successful in, over such a long period of time? I realized that I was going to be first in line in a lot of situations and that people would be following me. And if I were doing my job correctly, I would be thinking about social inequality. And that is a question that is never going to be solved. It's not a problem that can be solved. It's something where we can continue to move forward and think in more deep and comprehensive ways about how, where we want to go. I started my work in race at Brandeis, but I continued on through class and through gender and through sexuality and through nationalism and through ethnicity and ability, because these are all things that are axes of social inequality. So what kept me going was the importance of the question that I was investigating and recognizing that I got my education for a reason. It wasn't just for me. It was, for, it was bigger than me. Thank you. What kept you going? So, you know, our, our story goes back 24 years where Katie and I started working on RNA at a time when nobody cared about RNA and nobody thought it would be a good therapeutic. And people would look at me and say, why are you doing this? You're wasting your time. And Katie and I, you know, we kept working at it because we knew it had enormous potential. And the, the potential to us was so great, we weren't willing to give up. Now, it's funny nowadays, I'm asked, well, what, what do you tell your students, your PhD students, your assistant professors, when they come to you with a project that's not working? Would you let them go 23 years <laughs> without success? And, and I, I, of course, have to immediately say, no, of course not. I think you have to look at the project and decide, is this worth putting many years of your life and your career into. And, and that's how Katie and I felt. That's it. Susan? Um, well, I, my story is in a way similar to Drew's because uh, back in around the late 70s, I got, I, I was looking to work on something uh, different from my postdoc lab because I didn't want to be in a really competitive situation with, with these two incredible scientists I worked for. So um, I just looked around and I found that coronaviruses looked really, really interesting, just inherently interesting. Uh, there were human viruses that caused the common cold. There were very interesting animal models to work with. There were veterinary coronaviruses that were important that people were developing vaccines. And in, on top of that, that, these viruses had a really unique way of replicating that was just really un, really interesting and, um, and was amenable to study at that time. So that's what I decided to do for my new lab. And I know that um, it seemed like a really dumb thing for, to work on to a, a lot of people. Um, there was a very small group of people working on these viruses for, for the next, well, since 19, the late 70s. Um, and, and really, that was true until, uh, until about 2002, when SAR, the first SARS uh, outbreak happened, and all of a sudden, coronaviruses became somewhat important, and people knew what they were. 
And then, you know, but still they were kind of considered not that important. And then we had MERS in 2012. And then of course, uh, 2019 really put them onto the front page of the New York Times, which was incredibly shocking to me. So for me, I, it was probably just the intellectual interest that kept it going. And, and I kept working on different aspects of this really wide open field. So um, it, it just learning more and more about coronavirus is what, is what kept me going, plus um, training lots and lots of young scientists who now are doing all kinds of interesting things related to, to COVID-19. So after all these years, it's finally uh, somewhat gratifying to have worked on this virus for all this time. Yeah, just a follow up for each. Drew, you know, the, the issue that you get questioned about your graduate students, you were beyond graduate student days when you decided to stay with this RNA, so I'm sure that had an impact, but you still had to convince funders, you know, you still had to get funding to do your research. So I imagine that was a, a, an uphill struggle and something that was challenging. It, it, it was really a struggle every year. It, we were fighting for grants. We were fighting to get our papers published. We were fighting for recognition. Uh, I was still doing HIV research. So I, I would go to HIV meetings and I would sit down with the important people in the field you know, people like Gary Nabal and, and others and, and tell them about the RNA. And they would all look and they would nod and say, yeah, that sounds really interesting. And they would walk away with no interest at all. So it, it, it was a continuous struggle. Uh, we kept generating data. Um, we finally convinced companies that this was a potential, you know, great advance. And that, that's when things turned around. And Susan, how did you keep fund? How did you keep your funding coming in for your persistent pursuit of your research topic that was in question? Well, I mean, it's always difficult to get funding in, in any kind of basic science research, and so I just kept I just kept sending in grants. I knew I wouldn't get it the first or second time, but um, I just I just was very persistent, and and I've been funded uh, since like 1980 on coronaviruses. <laughs> I'll come back to the funding question later, but Patricia, I wanna ask you a question too. One of the most inspiring thing I've heard since being president at Brandeis was Anita Hill talking about Pauli Murray. She gave a wonderful talk about Pauli at a dinner. And I'm just wondering what it was like. I read in the citation that, that Pauli Murray was influential to you. What was that like studying with her? I don't think of it as studying with her. I think of it as learning from her. Mm -hmm. And the conversations that I was able to have with her, both in class, outside of class, and uh, after I graduated were really important. And what came from my time with her actually touches what the two of you have just touched on, which is how you keep going mm -hmm. through times when you are supported or not supported. Her life is a testament to working for social justice over decades. And I did not know that at the time. I was much younger and didn't that wasn't as thorough as I am now. But afterwards, when I came back to visit her life and research what she had done, it was fascinating to me how she remained focused through the depression, through World War II, through the 50s and the upheaval of that, through the Ghanaian constitution, through the feminist movement. There are many, many things that she was involved with that uh, we didn't know. And in fact, the problem was the buried history that we didn't know about her. So now there are a legion, there are quite a few people now who know about Pauli Murray. But if I had to say what quote, what was she like? She was just like all the other people who were trying very hard to continue their projects through lean times, through fat times. Right now we're in a fat time when it comes to social inequality and race. But how committed will people be 10 years from now? Who will be doing this work 10 years from now when it's not fashionable, when it's not required, when it's not pressured? She had the long game perspective on this. She was going to do it all the time. She was committed. That's, that's what I learned from her. That, that's fascinating. <laughs> you know, I have to say also that one of the, off, the often, a question I receive often, and you know, we have these 10 year reaccreditations where an outside uh, group of seven or eight academics come in and look you up and down uh, for a 10 year review and give you recommendations. And we had Peter Salovey, the president of Yale who chaired that reaccreditation. And one of the first things he said when he came on campus in 2018, which I think was just a year after Yale College built two new colleges and named one after Pauli Murray. After her. Um, it was the uh, amazing elevation in the eyes of some of these individuals, including Peter, when they found out that Pauli had her start 
and was at Brandeis. Uh, and all of a sudden, you know, and so the questions I get from alumni is, what are we going to do to honor Pauli Murray? What are we going to name to honor Pauli Murray? And we've been, you know, thinking about this uh, ever since. And that's why I, I'm curious and I'll probably want to talk to you uh, offline. But uh, yeah, she was an incredible uh, individual. The more I learn and hear about her. Uh, that's how I feel. All right. Here's a softball for all of you. Um, and, and what has been the most gratifying aspect of your work over the years? What has been most gratifying? It might not be as evident uh, as what we point out in citations uh, that we've read for you, but what has been most gratifying? The most gratifying for me right now is that I've gotten old enough to have people come and find me and say, I read you when I was an undergraduate and then I'm teaching you now in my class or you've affected my dissertation. The most gratifying has been how the ideas themselves have traveled. Even though when I was writing early on, I had no sense that anybody was ever going to read anything or think about anything I did. I got up and did it anyhow. And that's the Pauli Murray effect. So the most gratifying is running into all these people as I travel to many, many countries. Um, Brazil, I've been going to quite a bit and realizing that the kinds of things we're dealing with here are global issues. And that I did not know I was part of a much bigger story until now. So the gratifying thing is that I'm here today with you to receive this award and to thank you in person. So it's not a posthumous award because this is difficult work. Thank you. So to me, there's really two answers to this. The, the first answer is what my family, my friends, my collaborators want me to say, which is when the phase three results came out and we had 95% efficacy for both of the COVID-19 vaccines. And then there's my answer, which is probably was 2005 when Katie and I made the discovery that modifying RNA got rid of its inflammation. And when we made that, that, that told us that all of our work was, was correct. And there was a, an, an enormous future for the use of modified RNA, but we had to sit down and keep studying it and keep developing it. So wait, Drew, on that second point, just a clarification, what happened between 2005 and the successful vaccine? In other words, those 14 intervening years was it widely known that this was going to be successful or is it a long process that only became knowledgeable when you got the results of the phase three? So it, it took another seven or eight years before the world realized what we were doing and became interested. And, but we kept working all along. We kept doing animal models and other therapeutics. Um, about eight years after that, people caught on, companies started working with it and became much more interested. Well, thank you. Susan. So like, like Drew, I sort of have two different types of gratifications. One is scientific, just something that's difficult to, to describe because it's pretty technical. But when we see around 2010, we identified a particular protein in the mouse coronavirus that was a very good antagonist of the, of the host immune immune response. And then we found the same, very similar protein in MERS coronavirus years later. So that it's just a scientific finding um, of one of the ways that the, these viruses are really clever in shutting down the host innate immune responses. Um, so, and, and there are many other work like that, but that was the particular moment that was particularly gratifying for me in my lab. But then um, in the last year and a half, um, I've been really gratified to be able to give, uh, I think I've given 50 seminars on basic biology of coronavirus and history of coronaviruses and just educating people um, on, on, on how, how much we really knew about these viruses um, in the past, kind of like Drew, it was a very long, um, long study of these viruses that contributed to understanding them. And just, there are so many new coronavirologists now, there are probably thousands of them. And uh, I felt like my role has been to really educate them in, uh, in the biology of the viruses and the history of, of this field of research. So that's been pretty gratifying over the last year or so, year and a half. Thank you. And so here's my last question before turning it back to Lewis, who will then field questions that came in from coming from our audience. This one, you both, you all touched on this indirectly, but I'm curious to know what do you see um, for the future in terms of funding the research in the areas that you do? So social science research, uh, Patricia, and for scientific research for Drew and Susan, what do you see in future? I mean, some of us in the academy, of course, are more optimistic uh, with this particular uh, current administration and perhaps the past, maybe not, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts about this. 
I almost don't want to comment on this because I think I might sound too negative mm -hmm. because I, I honestly feel that um, until the U.S. as a country commits to having a conversation, it's going to be really difficult to find the kinds of social science topics and issues that we require. I mean, the battle over the census right now is, uh, is crucial. And that's, that's a crucial social piece of social science that occurs every 10 years. And a lot rides on that. And everything is contested around and even the questions that we ask. So the assault on the integrity of social scientists who are doing crucially important work for the scientific work to even be funded, to be taken seriously, to think about the implications for policy. Without that important social science piece and that policy piece, um, I don't know where we go. Now, I personally have stepped back from doing that kind of research because it's too frustrating for me. I know it's extremely difficult. Historically, it would have been difficult for me to get funded to do work on race and gender and those types of things. So why beat your head against the wall? I am much more optimistic about the future of philanthropy because I think they have been moving in directions because they have space to investigate questions that cross uh, cut basic science and social science and the humanities. Uh, to, and to look to questions that are bigger that we need to think about and to think of ways of putting together interdisciplinary teams to address those questions. So I don't necessarily see the government being the lead in that regard. I see the government being an important player in terms of government funding and perhaps corporate funding, although there we might have to have another conversation another day. But if I had to think about where the exciting research and que exciting questions are being funded, um, I don't necessarily look to the big institutions. I look to the little people. I look to the crowdsourcing. I look to the people who want to fund things that they want to see happen. So that money comes from many, many different places and we can never ever underestimate uh, the effects of lots of people giving a little bit of money or a little bit of time for something they want to see happen. I wanna see it all work together more seamlessly than uh, be in the polarized climate that we are now around this. Well, the polarization certainly would lead me to ask your advice, perhaps offline, not here, uh, about creating the environment on a university campus that allows in this polarized environment to have these important conversations, because it is a real challenge. I mean, you, you would think that this would be the place, a university, a college campus, where this would be a natural, where this type of conversation could be hosted and could be generated, but there are real challenges to that. So I, I'll, I'll seek your advice offline on that, too. And there are reasons why I am not a college president. And they do not have to do with qualifications. They do have to do with aspirations. Good luck with this. Okay. <laughs> Drew. Future so I, I also have to be careful not to be negative. But basic science funding is difficult. It, it's been yeah. difficult since I started. Yeah, I think it's always going to be difficult. The, the NIH funding goes up and down depending on the administration. But NIH over the past years has shifted a lot of their funding from basic science to therapeutics. And I think mm -hmm. that's hurt basic science research. And what they need to realize is that therapeutics comes from basic science research. I'm happy that private industry organizations have increased funding, that philanthropy is increasing its funding. I think all of that is necessary I think what the government, what people have to realize is that if we don't support basic science research, the United States is going to stop doing basic science research and we're going to stop making new therapeutics. We're going to stop understanding how things work. Uh, and, and I think that that's a shame and, and we really need to support basic science. Okay. And Susan. So I, of course, agree with Drew. And, um, my experience has been really almost all my funding has been from the NIH and a little bit from the Multiple Sclerosis Society when I studied coronaviruses in the brain. Um, but uh, it's it's always been a struggle. Uh, I think this last few years has been a little bit of boost. And as, as uh, Drew said, it goes up and down. Like, for example, coronavirus funding goes up with SARS. I, it, it didn't go up a whole lot this year. There were some supplements. Um, but I think I've been giving a lot of talks also urging supportive basic science. And I think that 
for even for philanthropy, it's very difficult because what what basic science like I do is really basic science. It's not applied. I mean, it's applied in a very very long term way, and I think it's really hard to explain that to people because even private funders want to understand, you know, how your science is going to uh, produce a drug or a vaccine, and and it, everything that I study, for example, is is in some point we'll, we'll do that, like understanding really really basic mechanisms of how viruses interact with host cells, but that's really hard to get funded. The, the, really the main way to get that kind of research funded is through NIH, and it takes an enormous amount of time to keep writing and rewriting grant proposals. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I guess I don't want to end on a, a down note. I hope it gets better. People say it, you know, be, that, that the public appreciates basic science more perhaps now, having gone through the pandemic. Um, so we'll see how it goes. Thank you. Not negative at all. I think getting the point across to our uh, viewers and all of us that basic science is the foundation for everything after. And so it is important. So very positive in that sense. Okay, let me turn this over to uh, Lewis and thank you all for this portion of uh, the Q&A. And Lewis will now take questions from folks in the audience. Thank you, Ron. And congratulations, Patricia, Drew, and Susan. Um, we have questions coming in. They're divided up a little bit, but just coming off of the last, the last feel. Um, Someone asked, I'm struck by the optimism that all three of you seem to have. What would you say to people, especially young people who are scared about the future? And I have the same Patricia, Drew, Susan lineup. So can we stick why with that? Why am I going first all the time? Luck of the Zoom. <laughs> well, no, okay, all right. <laughs> okay, um, I'm an optimistic person because I have no choice to be anything but. And actually what keeps me going are young people. I mean, I, I draw optimism from the fact that when you're young, you're in a position to take risks. You're in a position to think big, to not think in the, in the scripted boxes. And that's how you come up with innovation and wonderfully new things. Now, it may not look like that, when young people say to themselves, I have no future, I don't see, you know, it's, it's all uncertain, what shall I do? But I'm a person that had no certain future. I mean, I tell people, I, um, I have a, a career in a field that I'd never heard of before I went to college. I'd never heard of sociology. So how is it that you can be open to, uh, you have to be open to things and, and you have to build them if they are not there. That's the other thing. So to me, the big problems that face young people, um, are, I think young people are up to the task. So I, what I try and do is just encourage people because is this woman, Fannie Lou Hamer, who was a famous African-American um, activist who said, everybody has a light in them that shines. That little light in you, let it shine. And she really had this philosophy that each of us have a talent and a set of skills and you know, we can contribute. Now, my, what makes me sad is that we lose so many people who do not believe that they have that light in them. And that's the mental health issue that's been brought up earlier in, in your comments, President Ron's comments earlier. So, so why are we being optimistic about this? Because I know it's better than it was, but I also know it can be better than it, than it is now by a bit. And we each inherit that. Each generation inherits um, what the gifts from the generation before. So um, I think young people are very cool. And I think if we supported them and if we gave them things to read and see and space to think, uh, they will quickly figure out that they've got some wonderful things going on. Many of them already know that. But for those who don't, please find those who do and hang out with them and leave the rest of the people, including the old farts alone, if they're the ones that are bringing you down. That's what I would say to that. I don't know if that was dignified enough, but that would be my answer. That was fantastic, thank you. <laughs> True. So I, I have two kinds of optimism. I mean, for, from science, you know, we made a vaccine with incredibly high efficacy and 100% protection against death in 10 months. That, that's never been done before, not even close to that. So you know, science gives me incredible optimism about the future. We're making pan-coronaviruses vac vaccines where we're trying to cure genetic diseases like sickle cell with a simple injection. So I, I have enormous optimism. For, for the world, the, the, the optimism there is, is a little different. I mean, we, we went through a horrible four years of corrupt government who did terrible things, but 
people voted them out. They're gone now. So I, I have hope and I'm optimistic about our future in general. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Well, I don't have a whole lot to I kind of, I agree with both of the previous speakers. I, I just want to mention the, the young people that I work with too, and graduate students and postdocs who are um, just starting their careers and, um, and have that bright light. Um, and I mean, they have so many ideas so that they're teaching me at the same time as I'm teaching them. So I, I just see that collaboration between the senior people and these um, young, just aspiring scientists um, as, as a really productive thing and a really optimistic thing. And I think uh, they're gonna do really, really good things. Thank you, thank you. Um, also, I wanna just congratulate Drew and Susan on their milestone reunions. Um, so it's alumni weekend and I wanna acknowledge that. All right, to Patricia's point, we're gonna turn this around. Susan, you're first. <laughs> <laughs> um, did your time at Brandeis foster any interest outside of your profession, outside of your professional pursuits that you still value? Huh. Well, it fostered a lot of friendships that I still value. I, um, I had not seen some of my, um, my really close roommates for many years. And then um, in more, pre more recent years with internet and Facebook and all that, I, I really rekindled those friendships. Um, outside, I'm trying to think. I can't really think of anything that uh, other than friend, really good friendships. That's important. Thank you, yeah. Drew. So I, I think uh, uh, you know, I, I was always interested in science since I was a little kid. Uh, coming to Brandeis expanded my learning. I learned about politics. I learned about psychology. I learned about sociology. I learned about music, theater, and opera. So all of those things have continued to expand over my years after graduating. Um, so I, I think it, it really broadened me as a person. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Oh, you know, my mind kind of went blank when you asked that question because I spent pretty much all of my time at Brandeis studying. And that meant that I really learned to appreciate the life of the mind. Uh, and that's what I took with me from Brandeis in directly into community politics, which I also developed an interest in as well. So that I was a teacher, I was a young teacher when I left Brandeis after doing the year at Harvard. And, and basically I was bringing them and translating for them many of the books and the works and the ideas that I had been able to study at Brandeis. And I continue to read voraciously in order to be the best teacher that I could be. So in many ways, I don't see the, end of Brand, I don't see Brandeis ending. I sort of see it as sort of a one spot in things that are connected together. And I do have friends, I'm happy. Susan, I'm glad you mentioned that because I, I did make some friends at Brandeis. I wasn't totally antisocial, but um, it really was a time for, I got the gift to be able to step back and go into the world of ideas at Brandeis in a time period of time when it was, when there were so many ideas out there, especially on campus. Thank you, thank you. I have a question for Drew and Susan. Um, I'll, God forbid, when the next major global pandemic occurs, what will it take to have PCR testing available, PCR testing capacity to test everyone in the US in seven to 10 days and provide PPE to all frontline emergency and hospital staff in seven to 10 days? And Drew, you got it. So, you know, all of that is preparation. And we've always talked about preparation for a pandemic. Our problem is, is that sometimes we do it, sometimes we don't. I think what this past year and a half has taught us is that we need to be prepared. We don't know what the next pandemic is gonna be, but there's gonna be another one. We need to be prepared. We need to have PPE in stock. We need to be able to quickly make and certify tests to distinguish infected people. We need to have vaccines ready to go. We need to have therapeutics that are developed or, in, or close to the end of development that can be used quickly. We need to be more prepared. Um, I, I don't have too much more to add to what you said, except that now that we have uh, the tests for, uh, for SARS-2, it should be scientifically really easy to develop the next one for the next virus. It's, it's more of a question of, it's not a science question at all. It's a question of preparation. And, and the other thing that I have 
tell whenever I give these talks is that these coronaviruses are really similar in a lot of ways. And so once we have therapeutics that are in the pipeline that are, that are ready to go for SARS-2, those should be really quickly applicable to any, really any new coronavirus that should emerge. Thank you. So preparation is really the main thing, not, not there's no science in it really. Thank you. Patricia, this one's for you. Intersectionality seems like a new term, but it's something you've been researching for a long time. What do you want people to understand better about it? I want people to understand that there's, you want to start with something that is really important to you. And in my case, as an undergraduate, it was race because that really was the big question. But while I was a student at Brandeis, I discovered that it wasn't just race at all. It was race and class. The combination of race and class structures in this country, uh, I needed to know that to address the kinds of questions I was interested in, which had to do with educational equity. That's what I was interested in, the education of Black children. And that put me on a path to think about um, race and class and then gender, recognizing the com increasingly complex nature of social inequality. So if you pick one category and you stick with that your whole life, you can actually become a problem to other people who are interested in thinking more broadly and expansively around social justice. Now, one thing I very much liked about Brandeis and why I'm convinced I landed in the perfect place was its commitment to social justice. This was clearly there. And as a new institution, when I arrived, Brandeis and I grew up together. So hopefully we're not just growing old together, we're growing wiser as we get older. But it was a new institution where there was much more space for exploration. So this whole notion of following the path of the questions that concern you, social justice for me, and then intersectionality as the term we now use to apply to, Many, many paths that people have been on, starting in gender and then adding in race and adding in class and continuing on or starting in class or starting in sexuality for all of our students and colleagues who are LGBTQ. Um, and then working our way to build up those relationships and those networks intellectually and politically. Intersectionality is the best fit term for that very, very messy progress of finding our way toward greater equity. And the language of the administration would be equity, diversity, and inclusion. That's kind of the administrative way to describe it. But intersectionality is the intellectual foundation for thinking more inclusively about fairness and social justice. And I fold my comments about Brandeis in there because I think Brandeis was a very important place for me to develop that. Thank you. Thank you. All, right, for all three, but we'll start with Drew this time. Um, what would, advice would you give to recent alumni who are interested in becoming scholars or researchers? So I, I would give them you know, a, a, a huge clap uh, and congratulations. You know, I, I think that from what I've seen over the years, fewer and fewer people are going into academics, going into research in general. I, I think it's incredibly important. We need to keep encouraging our students to do this. Thank you. Susan? Uh, yeah, I, I, would, I would say to them to uh, pick some topic that you really have a passion for. You really have to love what you're doing. And then, um, and then just keep going at it. Just be persistent. And, I, and like Drew, I really also encourage the young people around me. Only, only if they really show a, a real natural interest and excitement about about whatever questions they're they're um they're thinking about working on i think i would i would take back on that and say asking a good question it's not a question of just picking a field and dabbling this interests me this week and next week i'll be a tennis player i mean many people think they can shop for a career but if you're thinking about a career in academia you really are making a commitment to knowledge you're making a commitment to new knowledge and all that is involved with that, whether it's funding or whether it's showing up for the meeting with the student you don't like or whether it's listening to people you must have a conversation with because you're the teacher. Um, and research is critical to that. 
Because if you really are not standing on the foundation of your own scholarship and your own ideas and your own passion, you're basically performing something that's, you know, somebody else's agenda. We don't need those kinds of people in academia. So I think it's a hard road. I mean, I often will say to students, you need to make decisions for yourself about this. You may not need to be a scholar or a doctor or you know, a, a scientist, but, for, uh, but you may really need to be one if you know what that is. I wanna see more people like Drew and Susan. I wanna see those passionate young people that say, you mean basic science can point me towards solving this huge global social problem that will come back? Why are we not talking that way? That's a lifelong commitment. So um, yeah, other than that, there's too much, there's too much in academic politics that's distracting. There's no point in going down that road because that's another story entirely. Thank you. Um, <laughs> we have actually one question that we certainly don't have an, I'm sorry, one more question. We don't have enough time for it for you, Patricia, but I'm gonna just throw it in here is, just came through. Do you have any thoughts on how we can address implicit biases? Which I know is I not an the, easy an easy answer in the short No, I think the question though is that it's the bigger question of racism, you know, or the bigger question of sexism, or the bigger question of you know the isms. You first have to recognize that there is structural inequality, and you have to recognize how you are actually performing behaviors that bring that on, or you are resisting that all the time. It's exhausting. It's truly exhausting to always be dealing with inequality or micromanaging other people's behaviors so they fit into the places where you think they belong. So implicit bias says, gee, I'm being racist or I'm being sexist, but I didn't know it and you're telling me about it. And now I'm all upset. You know, I don't see a problem with talking about these issues. I think they're very difficult and contentious to talk about, but that doesn't mean people are not good people. I like to think that people are doing the best that they can with what they have to work with. And that's where we start these conversations about implicit bias or these issues that are very contentious and difficult. Often people cannot see or listen to one another because they're so afraid of saying the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing. Or some are not, not afraid enough and they're always doing the wrong thing and saying the wrong thing. So we have to really think about you know, the language, if it helps have better conversations to talk about implicit bias, let's do that. But let's not sit around and try and be all nice and worried about implicit bias and how can we take it out of whatever situation we're in. We can be grown up about this. The kids can do this, I think. Thank you, that, that was fantastic. I appreciate that. Um, it's been an honor to, to speak with the three of you and Ron, again, congratulations to Ron. I'm, Turn it back to you. Sure, I was going to say the same thing. Boy, what a great conversation this was. At least from my perspective, I learned tons from listening to the three of you. And I hope that our alumni have also learned tons as well. And I want to thank all the alumni for tuning in. And hopefully many of them from your classes have reconnected at least virtually by seeing you. Uh, and I want to just thank you on behalf of Brandeis for all you've done, not only for society, but also what you represent for Brandeis. So thanks a lot. Congratulations. And I'll say again, uh, next year in Waltham. Thank you very much. <laughs>